Welcome to a snarky snippet, Threat Edition. Harry opens Chapter 1, making sure we know that Balmoral, the Queen's favourite place, was described by a visiting PM as surreal and utterly freaky, which he counters promptly with his love of the place, his paradise. His ghostwriter doubles down, saying it's a cross between Disney World and some sacred druid grove. However, Harry's happiness is paramount in this tale, the only thing we should care about. So it was with great relief he states clearly he was happy there. At that point, I just felt all the tension leave my body and I could breathe freely once more. Thank goodness he wasn't just surviving, but thriving. We get the royal family roll call, the only absent one being Mummy. Harry makes the observation that she's either bolted or been thrown out. Such a colourful way to describe a mutually agreed separation and divorce. Harry hears that Diana is with Dodie, although names aren't used, and he recounts in Chapter 2 their first introduction on a fondly remembered holiday in St. Tropez with Willie and Mummy. On meeting Harry, Dodie says, my name is, and Harry replaces it with blah, blah, blah. Who knew? Harry was a fellow snark. He then gives us several paragraphs, arguing against objective fact. He almost convinced me. I had to recover with binge-watching Neil deGrasse Tyson. However, I soon realized the purpose of the brainwashing. He was excusing what he was about to do several times in the book, describing private family spaces and how to get to them in explicit detail, the excuse being, it's all he can remember. He ponders if it's caused by his inner soldier. I suspect it was his inner celebrity author who just received a huge advance to give the public lots of private juicy detail. At this point, Harry finds the floor plan approach much easier. This segues neatly into what seemed like an obvious threat. He muses that Balmoral is built on the same site as a 14th century version where another Prince Harry was exiled, whereupon he came back and, I quote, annihilated everything and everyone in sight. Let's just pause here shocked, shall we? I confess to missing that when I first reviewed the book without snark. Quick plug, the vids are still available on the Vintage Read Show YouTube. However, could this explain the royal family keeping their distance from Harry? Survival. Anyway, let's put on some armour and press on. After giving us a very detailed plan so we can get to the Queen's bedroom without detection, he whinges that Willie had the better half of the nursery, not because he was born first and bagged the best bed, but because he was the heir, and lowly, downtrodden spare Harry got the smaller, less luxurious part to ring for servants from. He doubles down with talk of being a spare organ factory for Willie, kidneys, blood transfusions, bone marrow, saying that it was all made very clear to him. OK. He also claims that after his birth, his father went off to meet his girlfriend, Camilla, I presume, literally minutes after meeting him for the very first time. A snarky note, facts don't bear this out. However, spare isn't about facts, it's about revenge and resentment and whiny entitlement, and we're only on page 15. He concludes by telling us that every boy and girl imagines themselves as a prince or princess. Or well, not so much as you've been one, Harry. He manages a slight hint of optimism, stating it wasn't half bad being a real prince, third in line for the throne. It appears Harry became less fond of the concept the further down the line he slipped. Bye.